Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the final lecture, and unfortunately it's a rather long one, but it's on nuclear chemistry. Nuclear chemistry is a huge field in chemistry, and it's one that we will only treat very superficially, and then we'll move on. One of the pieces of evidence for the fact that atoms are made of smaller particles came from the work of Marie Curie. She lived from 1876 to 1934. She discovered radioactivity, the spontaneous disintegration of the nucleus of some elements into smaller particles. Nuclear reactions obviously involve the nucleus of the atom. The nucleus loses particles and protons and neutrons get rearranged. The disintegration of the nucleus releases a tremendous amount of energy that holds the nucleus together, which is called binding energy. Normal chemical reactions involve electrons, not protons and neutrons. There's three primary types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. You do need to know the difference and what they produce. Alpha is a positively charged helium isotope. We usually ignore the charge because it involves electrons, not protons and neutrons. Beta produces an electron and gamma is pure energy. It's called a ray rather than a particle. When a radioactive nu nucleus emits an alpha particle, a new nucleus forms that has a mass number that is four less than that of the initial nucleus and an atomic number that is decreased by two. And that's where the four over two next to the helium comes from. Mass number is on the top, atomic number is on the bottom. In a balanced nuclear equation, the sum of the mass numbers and the sum of the atomic numbers for the nuclei of the reactant and the products must be equal. When you do equations for alpha decay, you have to write, write it with decay. You have to determine the mass number, atomic number, and then finally the symbol before you complete the equation. So you can see here that we're writing the incomplete equation. We've got radon 222 yields some kind of particle plus 4 heliums. Well, we know that the mass number is going to be 222 minus the 4 from the helium, so it's 218. The atomic number is going to be 86 minus 2, which gives us 84. You then look up that atomic number on your periodic table, and we find out that it's polonium, and then you complete the equation. So when we write the resultant equation, it's going to look a little different. So I'll show you that on this screen. So we have our radon-222, so let me get that in there. Two twenty-two, and its atomic number is 86. It produces polonium, which we looked up, plus that 4 over 2 helium nucleus, because it's alpha decay. And we know that 222 minus 4 is 218. 86 minus 2 is 84, which is how we know it's polonium. So that's our completed equation. A beta particle is an electron that is emitted from the nucleus. So it forms when a neutron in the nucleus breaks down. When you do the equations for beta decay, first you write an equation for the decay. So we're going to do potassium-42, which is a beta emitter. So we know it's going to tell you in the question what it's producing. So we know that since it's beta, it's producing an electron. So we start off with potassium-42. We know what potassium's atomic number is, so we know it's 42 over 19. Gives you a new nucleus plus an electron. Our mass number is going to be the same because electrons essentially weigh zero but our atomic number will change. So we take 19 minus negative 1, which gives us an atomic number of 20. 20 is the element calcium. So you can see here that our final balanced equation is 4219K gives us 4220 calcium plus 1 electron. 
other nuclear particles are written as such. So a neutron is written as 1 over 0. A positron is a positive electron, and that's written like this, with a 0 plus 1 e. And a proton is usually referred to as hydrogen plus 1, and we write that as a 1 over 1 hydrogen. And any other elemental isotope can be nuclear particles as well, but these are the other three common ones. A half-life is the time required for half, half of the nuclei in a sample of a specific isotope to undergo radioactive decay. And you can see here a list of different half-lives. Now one of the questions that has come up to me many times is how do we know if it's so long, um, how do we know that it's actually 1.25 billion years, for example? Well, we know that because we use rather large samples of those radioactive isotopes and so we can calculate by percentage what the half-life is. The, when it says, talks about radioactive parent and stable daughter, that's what happens after it has emitted its radiation, then it becomes the stable daughter nucleus. When we look at half-life and radiometric dating, we get some interesting data. Pretty much after 10 half-lives, depending on which radioisotope you're talking about, depends on the amount of time, but after 10 half-lives, basically what happens is our levels become so low that it's undetectable. And you can see here that as the parent atoms decay, the number of daughter atoms crosses it and increases. And so, again, after 10 half-lives, we're pretty much shielding anything that we could see from the parent atoms. And you can see that they're exactly 50-50 after that first half-life, because that makes sense. You've got 50% parent, 50 parent atoms, 50% stable daughters. So let's take a look at this question. The half-life of iodine-123 is 13 hours. How much of a 64 milligram sample of I-123 is left after 39 hours? So I'm going to show you how to do that on this sheet. Let me get a clean one. Okay, so we know it's 13 hours is T one half. Okay, and it says that now we've got 39 hours. Well, 39 divided by 13 gives you 3. So we know that it's gone through 3 half-lives. Okay, so it's gone through 3 half-lives. So remember that 3 half-lives means that you've decreased the amount from the original by half 3 times. Okay, or you can say, you know, one-half to the third power. If we did one-half to the third power, we come up with one-eighth. So we take that original amount, which was 64 milligrams, we multiply it by one-eighth, and we get eight milligrams remaining after 39 hours. In gamma radiation, energy is emitted from an unstable nucleus, indicated by the letter M following the mass number. The mass number and the atomic number of the nucleus are now the of the new nucleus are the same. So remember, gamma is just pure energy. So the the radioactive parent does not change to a different element. Radiation ionizes atoms in cell tissue and causes chemical reactions akin to decomposition and combustion. In other words, it's like that tissue has either died or caught on fire. It also disrupts nucleotide sequences, which means that it mutates your DNA. None of these things are particularly handy. So one of the things that we do to protect from radiation when we work with it is to wear lead-infused suits. So if you've gone to the dentist and they ask you all sorts of uncomfortable questions about your personal life, 
what they do next is they put this big lead-lined apron on top of you. It's very heavy. And that's to protect the rest of your body, not your head, um, that's being x-rayed, from the excess radiation. Additionally, you can prevent radiation exposure by keeping your distance. It's called the inverse square law, which means that the intensity of radiation is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source. You can also see here that various things will shield you from different types of radiation. Particles, uh, alpha particles, will be shielded by just a piece of paper. I think it's about six inches away and an alpha particle is totally harmless to you. But alpha particles are the most dangerous if you ingest them because basically they cook you from the inside. Beta particles can be blocked by plastics, small, small amounts of wood, thin metals, etc. But gamma rays need concrete or lead and you need quite a bit of distance to get through um, with gamma rays. And you can also see on this figure the level of penetration when you talk about organic tissue of each type from the outside. Okay, so now we're going to talk about different types of nuclear uh, reactions. And the first one is fission. And fission is when you split the nucleus. And as it splits, it produces fission products. And those fission products also produce new neutrons, which cause more fissionable nuclei to then start to split, and so on and so on. So it creates a huge chain reaction. And we harvest fission uh, energy in nuclear power. Currently, there's about 103 nuclear power plants in the United States, and about 435 worldwide. 17% of the world's energy comes from nuclear power. However, one of the things that you need to understand, first of all, is that with nuclear power, people always are concerned about the waste, and that is a big problem. However, it can be dealt with safely. The other thing with nuclear power is that in the United States, there is not a single, as of 2013, there's not a single newer power plant, nuclear power plant, that is less than 35 years old. So we're talking about very aging facilities because people have been so afraid of nuclear power that uh, they're, not, they're afraid to build new ones. We've had very few nuclear incidents in um, the United States. The two biggest, most recent nuclear incidents um, were Chernobyl in Russia in 1986 and Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant in Japan in 2011. The other form of nuclear energy generation that can be harvested is fusion, and this is actually what happens in our sun, where you have um, nuclei being fused together to create heavier elements. So basically, fusion is a process by which the multiple like-charged atomic nuclei will join together to form that heavier nucleus. Small nuclei will combine. So example, we've got deuterium and tritium, which is um, I'll show you on the board. Give me one second. Okay, so let me get a new sheet and I'll show you what that looks like. Deuterium and tritium are both isotopes of hydrogen. So deuterium is 2 over 1 and you combine that with a tritium, which is a 3 over 1 um, isotope. When you combine those, you get a helium nucleus plus a neutron. So this occurs in our Sun and other stars as well. Fusion, um, when that process happens though, excess, excessive heat cannot be contained. Attempts at cold fusion have failed so far. And hot fusion is also difficult to contain. However, we have a brand new nuclear reactor that uses fusion that is being piloted in France. And since 75% of all power generated in France is nuclear, they were prime candidates to start that out. So let's take a look at this practice problem. It says, what radioactive isotope is produced in the following bombardment of boron? 
Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do this on the other board. And I'm just going to write it under the fusion equation. So we've got 10,5 boron plus helium, because this is a fusion reaction. It produces some element plus a neutron. Okay, so what we do is we add them together. So we get 10 plus 4 minus the 1 here, so that gives us 13. And then 5 plus 2 minus 0 gives us 7. So 7 is the atomic number of nitrogen. So that gives us 13 over 7, N. New elements or new isotopes of known elements are produced by bombarding an atom with subatomic particles such as a proton or neutron, or even much heavier particles such as helium or boron. Some of the examples are production of radioactive um, P31, so phosphorus 31, for use in studies of phosphorus uptake in the body, and you can see a scan using that. Reactions using neutrons are called gamma reactions because a gamma ray is usually emitted, and so that's what's happening here. That's why we can pick it up on our scanners. Radioisotopes used in mes medicine are often made by gamma reactions, and so keep it, that in mind when we talk about cancer treatment. It's producing that high energy. Food can also be irradiated with gamma rays, and we usually use cobalt-60 or cesium-137. Irradiated milk, for example, has a shelf life of three months without refrigeration. The USDA has approved irradiation of meat and eggs thus far. Okie dokie, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the final lecture of this semester. So, if you have any questions, please feel free to join me during office hours. Make sure that you practice with this material. It's not as difficult as naming organic compounds, but it still can be quite confusing until you get some practice under your belt. Have a great day.